Welcome to the Payroll Podcast, the show that explores the latest insights and innovations in the world of payroll. Hello and welcome back to the Payroll Podcast. My name is Nick Day. I'm CEO at JGA Recruitment Group. We are specialist global payroll recruiters. And today I'm really excited to welcome a special guest who is a bit of an expert in relation to pay on demand or EWA as it's also known, early wage access. It's a hot topic, not just here in the UK, but over in the US and beyond as well. And Jim Colasano has more than 25 years of experience in all facets of the payment and cash management industries. So a real expert on the show today to help guide us and navigate us through the waters of EWA. Now, he joined the Clearinghouse in 2016 as a senior vice president in the Product Development and Strategy Group, where he's focused on product strategy and bank readiness for TCH's new real-time payment system. Now, in this role, he is working closely with TCH owners, owner banks on opportunities and applications to address business-related payment problems and to identify strategic priorities for this new payments infrastructure. Don't worry if this is confusing you all. We're going to really get into the detail of what this all means during the course of today's show. Before we do that, let me give you a bit of Jim's background. Before joining the Clearinghouse, he spent 10 years with HSBC as a product executive in their payments and cash management group. During that period, he served as the global product head for their payables business, which had responsibility for faster payments initiatives, as well as cash, check and ACH payment products worldwide. Before joining HSBC, he also spent 15 years with J.P. Morgan Chase in a variety of cash and treasury management roles, and he holds a master's degree in banking and finance from Pace University. So I'm sure you can all agree we have a bit of a cash and payments uh, expert on the show with us today. Uh, How does that all relate to payroll? We're about to find out. Before we do, Jim, I'm going to ask you the question I ask all of my guests, which is this. First, welcome to the show. And second, what does the word payroll mean to you? Well, thank you, Nick. I appreciate that that uh, introduction. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here today, and I appreciate the invitation to be on your show. So in, in thinking about payroll, and again, I am a payments expert, um, not a payroll expert. But when you ask me about what payroll means, I want to go all the way back to where I started in payments. I started in treasury operations, right? Um, and so I have a real appreciation for what the lifeblood of a company is, and that is the operations group. And when I think about payroll, when you ask me that question, uh, it brings me back, you know, 30 some odd years, back to those days when I was in operations, making everything work. And that's what payroll does for most companies. Um, And if I needed to describe it, I would probably describe it in four words. Uh, It's fundamental, Uh, it is meaningful, it is difficult, and it is underappreciated, right? Nice. Uh, it's hard to be all of those things at the same time, uh, but it is, it is the kind of job that is taken for granted very often, but it impacts everybody from the, the mailroom clerk all the way to the CEO. It has to happen flawlessly every week or even every day, as we're going to be talking about now. Uh, and when you miss it, it impacts people in very meaningful ways. Uh, It is really, from my perspective, uh, the most important function that any business performs. Wow, I'm glad I asked that question. I think in uh, over 100 episodes, uh, Jim, that's one of the most articulate and concise and accurate answers, I think, from my perspective anyway, I've ever heard. Um, You broke that down wonderfully. And I think uh, I can speak on my, my listeners' behalf here that I imagine there's some resonance going on. Some people are going, absolutely right. It is complicated. It is meaningful. It's incredibly important. Uh, It is definitely underappreciated. So thank you for for a really great response to that first question. What a great way to start the show. But let's let's talk a little bit and and dive into the detail of what today's show is going to be all about, which is something we call as an acronym or an an, uh, EWA. some people know it as early wage access. Some people know it as earned wage access. And I understand there's a difference between those two things, which we may need to just uh, dive, into, uh, dive into that detail in just a moment. But it's also known as on-demand pay, payroll on demand. There's loads of different sort of uh, terms that are, that are coming out of different payroll providers. I wonder if you could just break it down, what it actually means in its um, in its most basic terms, really. And just so that when people hear EWA going forward, they have a real crystal view of what that means and what that is. Well, 
from from my desk, right? So I'm looking at this from a payment perspective, right? And I will tell you that when we're talking about earned wage access or early wage access, of the difference between the two, one, uh, the the earned wage access is where you're providing uh, an individual with money that they've already earned, uh, but haven't yet been paid. So it's money that they are definitely due by their employer because they put in the time and they've actually earned those wages yeah. and they're getting yeah. access to those funds uh, a bit earlier than they normally would. Uh, and there are very meaningful regulatory aspects of that because when you're getting paid for wages that you have earned, there's no credit uh, facility there. There's no credit implication there. Uh, the um, early wage access um, in terms of the way it's typically looked at in the U.S., is getting access to the wages that you will earn in that pay period. So you're getting access uh, early to a portion of your paycheck. It doesn't necessarily have to be earned by that point in time, uh, but it will be paid out with your next pay period. And that is the difference there. And in that instance, since you haven't earned that pay yet, there are implications and it's something that, oh, are, yeah. that the industry's regulators are looking at in terms of whether it's an extension of credit uh, or whether it is actually just an early payout from your employer. Uh, but that is kind of the difference between the two. And I'll add in a third, um, which isn't necessarily fall into those two categories, but something that's been very prevalent, especially through the pandemic, uh, which is instant payout. Uh, and that's more something that aligns with gig economy workers. Uh, so sure. you do have drivers who uh, want to be paid at the end of their shift. Uh, and those individuals will typically look uh, to the RTP network or other payment mechanisms to get money in their account immediately uh, when their shift is done. So those are kind of the three flavors of early access to wages that we look at here in the U.S. Fantastic. And again, really articulately put and very, sim uh, very simple for people to understand. So I appreciate that. And I think it's important because the, the EWA acronym can be confusing because it can mean two different things. So it's important that we do uh, understand what we're meaning by these terms. And in particular today, in, in the context of today's interview, we're talking very much about earned wage access. Um, tell me how that relates then to the work that you're doing at the Clearinghouse and, um, and, and the solution that you, that you guys are providing. Okay. So uh, as you mentioned at the outset, uh, I joined the Clearinghouse about seven years ago to launch uh, the RTP network which in the U.S. is the first new payments infrastructure uh, to be built and launched in the U.S. in 50 years. Uh, so from a U.S. perspective, ACH, or the BACS network, if you're looking at this from the U.K. perspective, uh, was the last payment network that we actually launched in the U.S. that actually moved money between financial institutions in the U.S. We stood up this infrastructure seven years ago, and what it does is it operates 24 hours a day, seven days a week, uh, with good and final movement of money between um, a paying institution and a receiving institution. Uh, so it actually moves money uh, from one account to another. So it's not a credit-based service. It's not a batch-based service. It actually happens in real time. And the nice thing about that, if I can kind of put it into a payroll context, without going into early wage access, let me give you one of the immediate benefits that companies look at when using real-time payments. In the US, if you get paid on Friday before a long weekend, uh, you won't get access to that money until Tuesday of the following week because the banking system is shut down for three days. Right. So uh, with the real-time payment network, uh, if you get paid on the Friday or if your pay cycle falls on a Saturday or a Sunday, the money is in your, your account instantaneously and predictably. So in those instances, the operation of our network 24 hours a day, seven days a week, with certainty that the money is actually going to get there, uh, is really one of the attributes that supports not only payroll, but every other type of payment application. So sure. that individuals can rely on that money exactly when they're due. So typically payroll cycles in the U.S. are biweekly or 15th and 30th of the month. In a lot of instances, those do fall on weekends. And that can be very disruptive to individuals who really rely on that pay to be there or who may have debits processed against their account or 
uh, standing, uh, standing orders that are processed against their account. So making sure that that money is in their account when they expect it to be there is extremely important. And that is the type of capability that the RTP network enables. Yeah, oh, fantastic. And the RTP network, for those not familiar, it stands for Real Time Payments Network, correct? So uh, maybe lots of people in the UK may not be as familiar with it. So it, uh, my understanding that in terms of how that relates to EWA, essentially, is if if people have earned their money in advance and they don't have to wait, as you say, till Tuesday, that can be paid to them on the Saturday, which can ease a lot of the uh, the financial stresses uh, and the mental health uh, implications that go with financial stress as well, right? Yes, exactly. And and in in the in the prior environment, um, I, everything operated in batch. Everything settled the next day. So even if you did have a front end uh, that could exchange information. So you knew how much an employee earned and you wanted to give them that money. You would need to extend credit because settlement would not take place until the following sure. day because you can't move money between the banks on a weekend. So you might be able to give that employee their money on Friday if they wanted it, but you'd need to float that money until Tuesday, right? So what the RTP network does is it eliminates that, compresses it down to seconds because right now every individual transaction Right, uh, right down to a penny, will settle within seconds with finality. So s- some of the instances and some of the stories that we've heard in terms of the way people use earned wage access in the U.S., and typically most of the advances that people look for uh, or most of the money that they're looking for are small dollar amounts just to get them through to the next sure. page. Uh, and we've had examples of people who are at a checkout line at a grocery store and they are $15 short. And they will literally go online. They will see that they've got $100 that they've earned. Uh, and they will get information that they will request $15 so they can check out that day. And by the time they get to the checkout counter, the money's in their account. Amazing. Uh, so those, those kind of instances. And that's what's enabled using that technology. I remember, I'll never forget it, uh, during the midst of the pandemic, obviously we specialize in recruitment. And I remember dealing with a particular candidate who uh, was unable to attend an interview because she couldn't afford the train fare to get there because she had to wait till the end of the month to get paid. And it was literally damaging her opportunity to secure employment. Now, had she had a, a, an EWA um, accessibility, she had earned the money, she'd finished the job, she could have accessed that to pay for the travel to get to the next part of her career journey. And I think that was the first time it really hit home to me as a, as a recruiter operating in this space saying, Wow, there are a lot of benefits here that we don't see and a lot of people struggling and wouldn't need to struggle if they could access their wages that they've rightly earned a little bit earlier. Now, I'm interested to know, particularly with your background, um, Jim, in, in the banking industry with, with some big names that we mentioned there in the introduction, one of the biggest evolutions I've seen in the world of payroll recently, and, and, and I would say it started before the pandemic, but we're seeing it really accelerate post-pandemic, is the introduction of open banking. And we've now got banking institutions offering payroll services. Obviously, that links. I, I imagine there must be some links there in relation to the RTP network as well. H- how is open banking influencing EWA and the payroll space as well? From from from, and I, I asked that question of you because you have that banking expertise and that banking background. You may have a slightly different perspective on on the impact of open banking on on the payroll profession as a whole. So uh, let, let me speak broadly uh, because open banking hasn't quite reached the US yet. Uh, we, okay. are, we are looking at it now, but what we tend to look at as an infrastructure provider in the U.S., which is what the clearinghouse is, we're a payment infrastructure provider. Um, as an infrastructure provider, we look at the enabling technologies. So when when I mentioned before that the last payment network that we had in the U.S. was 50, 50 55 years old, uh, it wasn't exactly built on standards that lent themselves to a modern commerce environment. Uh, that leveraged APIs that supported the use of open banking. Um, And one of the the basic tenets of the architecture that we built for the RTP network uh, was that it did support APIs, right? It it did have uh, an instantaneous response to every message. Uh, It does support online commerce. It does support um, uh, mobile commerce. Uh, And we did that intentionally because we wanted to f- future-proof the system. Now, we do have technology companies who leverage the, um, the network today, but they can't directly access the RTP network. They have to go through a bank. But they already use the messaging standards that we have uh, and the APIs that are in place to 
to enable some of the capabilities that they're starting to launch and market. Uh, so we are starting to move in that direction. But in order to allow that, we needed to use a standard that accommodated APIs. We're using a standard which, which in the banking environment is called ISO 2022. And yep. it is way a global standard. And one of the nice things about that, uh, and we've already demonstrated this, uh, is that it would allow us to do cross-border instant payments. We've already tested that with EBA clearing, um, uh, where we've, we've cleared and settled cross-border transactions uh, within 30 seconds. Uh, so we've oh. proven that it can be done cross-border. So again, we built the architecture to be expandable uh, and to be able to accommodate the direction of commerce that's in place today. Now we do know the regulatory environment in the US grinds a bit slowly, so we will get there, uh, but we do have a lot of programs right now that are using and leveraging APIs. Uh, and we do expect as we move more toward an open banking environment, that this network will be very accommodative of that evolution as it takes place in the market. Right. And one thing I love about that response, uh, Jim, is your readiness for change. And I highlight that because it's something that, particularly in the world of payroll, and I say this as someone who's been uh, been in the payroll industry now for over 20 years, it's been my career, it's been my life, but sometimes change isn't something that um, the payroll industry is always ready for. And I think that on-demand pay, I remember a survey that was done over here in the UK, maybe things are different in the US, but it was two years ago. And we have a Charleston Institute of Payroll Professionals here in the UK as our kind of our governing body for payroll professionals and, the, and so on. And they ran a, a study with payroll managers and 86% so they didn't feel that um, on-demand pay would impact their business in the next two years. Now, I know if we ran that study again, that number is already significantly different. We've seen the, the, the world of on-demand pay in the UK and Europe really advance very quickly, very rapidly. And because of the benefits it can bring, and I think a lot of it was associated with misunderstanding of what it meant and people's education has improved. I'd love to know that from your perspective in the US, what's the growth been like for, for the clearinghouse in relation to, to earn wage access over the last year or two years? Have you seen a, a big increase in, in its adoption? Are people ready for the for earned wage access? Uh, we absolutely have. Uh, as a matter of fact, it's a cornerstone application of the use of the RTP network. Uh, right now, wage access in the various forms uh, represents about 25% of the activity on the network. And what I defined as a very narrow slice of earned wage access uh, is probably about 15% of the network right now and growing every single month. Now, one of the other things, you know, we, we talked about the fact that this is very important for people who live paycheck to paycheck. But one of the things that we've also found is in the professional community, uh, and these are people who aren't living paycheck to paycheck, are also looking for earned wage access and on-demand pay because they want to optimize the use of the money. They don't want that money sitting with their employer when they can invest it in opportunities and want to be able to get that money as quickly as possible so they can take advantage of investment opportunities that they see. So we see the demand up and down the spectrum. Um, and one of the other things that you're seeing is a lot of people coming out of the pandemic um, have gotten used to um, you know, give me what I want when I want it, right? That, that whole mentality right, right. now where it's, it's becoming an expectation and not a requirement and not a request, right? So what we found, and, and I talk more to banks than I do to payroll companies, but I think the same is true. When you talk to banks, it's not, is there something I can provide to differentiate me? And the answer is no. You will be differentiated if you can't provide these services to your customers, and your, and your competitors can. If the bank down the street is offering real-time RTP capabilities and you're not, your customers are going to start walking with their feet. And we've heard the same thing from recruiters when they talk to prospective uh, hires for different firms uh, and they're talking about the potential benefits. This is one of the benefits that they're constantly hearing in terms of recruitment. Uh, can you offer me early access to my wages, uh, money when I need it? Um, you know, it, it, it's in that same vein of conversation with how much vacation time do I get? Uh, sure, so again, sure. it's starting to become an expectation uh, as we move forward. And that I think was a lot of that was fueled by the pandemic. But we hear a lot of that now from recruiters, 
Uh, we hear it a lot from organizations, from payroll processors. And this is where kind of the HR functions and the payroll functions start to really interrelate. I mentioned before that, you know, payroll is one of those applications like uh, back office operations on the bank side where, you know, most front office operations don't really care what the back office does as long as it works until you need to work together on something like this. We found that to be the case with real-time payments, that front office and back office operations are now working together. The strategy, the execution, and the operation are now three legs of a stool, all working together to move this forward. And I think the same is probably true in the payroll industry, where the payroll uh, operations, uh, your HR departments are starting to work together to formulate some of these strategies. And this is where it starts to come together. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I mean, I'm one of those recruiters that would be uh, supporting that narrative, uh, Jim. I mean, I certainly, if there were two opportunities side by side and one offered earned wage access and one didn't, nine times out of 10, the, the employee concern is going to go with the one that can. Uh, and it, I, I like the way that you mentioned that it doesn't just impact those on the, uh, you know, the, the paycheck to paycheck uh, breadline, because a lot of people are living within their, you know, just about within their means as it is. It doesn't matter what way your pay scale is, but with inflation as it is, certainly here in the UK, it's sort of 10, 11%. You know, people now are, are, are in interest rates rising at the same time, right? People are, are get themselves in financial difficulty very, very quickly. And you don't want them turning to, you know, high interest loans or other scenarios if they don't need to, if the money is there and it's been earned. And I think there's a, there's a real case for it to be uh, provided on that basis as well. And I, I would certainly agree that the attraction retention piece, I mentioned there from a recruitment perspective, it's not just about attracting staff. As you say, it's about retaining staff. And um, that's where the value is in the recruitment process. Uh, you don't want to be hiring people and rehiring over and over again. It can get very expensive. And um, I think the one shift that I've seen in the payroll industry, specifically post-pandemic with the great resignation and everything else, is the power now is much more with the employee. They can pick and choose with their feet where they want to work. And we need to create an environment where they feel safe, where they feel included, and where they feel their best interests are being looked after. And I think this absolutely plays into that uh, equation. Um and I think because it's it's also such a close relationship between financial health and mental health. Now, I don't know from your perspective if you've done any analysis on this or, or if you've run any, or got any statistics you can you can quote or, or bring to the table in relation to what you've seen from an, an attraction and retention side of things in relation to EWA. Maybe I'm interested because that's my world, but I'd love to know what you've seen on the US side. So, so there have been a number of studies that have been done about financial stress that employees are under. Um, and uh, some of the statistics from the U.S. government have come out, have indicated that most employees, I think it's 60 percent of employees, uh, could not handle an unexpected expense of four hundred dollars between pay periods, yeah. uh, which is pretty amazing when you think about that. Uh, they've also quoted some statistics around um, the number of hours of work that are lost uh, to financial stress for employees because they don't have, um, they don't have uh, the options of getting the money in advance. Uh, I, I forget what the numbers were, uh, but I think it was like four to six hours of pay period um, of, of productivity that is lost uh, because of the type of financial stress. And we've also heard uh, from some of the consulting firms who've done some analysis in this area uh, that not only does it stress the employee, but it stresses the family. So all of that is a very material and a very real concern. Uh, one of the things I will tell you that the banking industry is very, very interested in uh, is earned wage access is a phenomenal tool, but it's only a tool. And it can be abused like everything else. And the one thing the financial services industry is trying to do in the U.S. is educate consumers, uh, educate employers, provide additional services um, over and above uh, just early access to wages, uh, to increase financial literacy, to increase um, uh, an individual's knowledge of how to budget and how to manage and how to use these services. Because yeah. the last thing you want is somebody uh, digging themselves into a deeper hole uh, because they're getting access to their, their wages before their pay cycle. And then when the pay cycle comes up, they don't have enough money to pay the normal bills that they would in that period. So it, it is a complete suite. And I think a lot of companies are starting to look at their employees' financial wellness more holistically. Um, and I think uh, we're, we're coming to the realization that financial literacy across the board in the U.S. Um, is not very high. So, again, as you start to look at giving more tools 
to individuals. That's got to come along with education in terms of how they should use this in a responsible way so that it doesn't wind up being another crutch that only uh, gets them into worse shape. So those are the kind of things that, that we've been seeing. But none of the statistics, um, you know, are, are, are positive in, in terms of, um, you know, employees being de-stressed by getting, by getting paid. Yeah. Um, managing a budget is, is one of the most stressful things. And there have been clear uh, research done around the fact that it does impact productivity in the material way. Uh, well, I was going to mention that as well. So, so it's cut in, but something's quite interesting here. And there's, there's always going to be an exception to the rule. There's always going to be someone which, you know, where, where this doesn't work for whatever reason, right? But if you're talking about generics, the two things I wanted to pick up on, one was actually, if you're able to access your wages early, you typically, if that reduces your, your, your financial stress, then it means you're a happier and therefore usually a more productive employee. So actually, not only you're not losing the hours through the stress and the absences, you're gaining more productivity when they are there. But what I've heard as well, and maybe this more relates to the instant pay access you were talking about earlier on at the start of the show, but actually when people know they're going to earn the wages, rather than have less hours due to anxiety, you find, particularly those on shift patterns, they're asking for more shifts than they would have asked for before because if they want to go out on a Friday or a Saturday, whatever it is, they go, you know what, I can take up another shift. I'm going to get paid instantly. And actually we're finding people are, are taking more hours to help them manage their finances more effectively, knowing they don't have to wait to the end of the month for that to come through. It's almost like you leave the reward too long. I won't take the extra shift. If you reward me now, I'll do it. And I don't know if you've seen that through your research. It's certainly something I've seen here in the UK. Uh, it is something that we've seen in, in terms of the whole phenomena of gig economy, in terms of how people are kind of filling in yeah. and adding more hours. And when you start to take a look at the trends, in the US, you absolutely see that. The more people can rely on getting paid for the work that they do, the more they will manage their time and the more they will they will manage it very efficiently and very productively because they know they're gonna get paid for the time that they work. So, and, and even anecdotally, um, when you speak to folks, I have, I have a tendency as a payments guy, I have a tendency whenever I get into a car with an Uber driver, I'll talk to them about how they get paid and, and why they work um, you hear that pretty consistently, right? It's I work more hours because I can rely on that money. Um, you know, if it's if it's um, you know a homemaker um, and and their daughter uh, has a prom coming up and they need to pay for the dress, it's like I'm just going to put in a few more hours because I know at the end of that shift I'm just going to get my money and I'll be able to pay for the dress, right? Uh, so, like I said, you see that in some of the research, but you hear it very anecdotally everywhere you go. Uh, when you provide people with those options, they will manage their time more productively. Uh, and that's what so they're asking for, isn't it? It's, it's, it's the options piece. And as you said, the uh, the instant mentality that the world has become used to with, with Netflix and streaming services and Uber, whatever it is, right? We were able to access things immediately. So it almost seems archaic that we can't do that with our with our wages. If I'm a payroll manager then listening to this, a payroll professional, an HR director, and I'm thinking, you know what, this is something that I want to bring into my business. I, I wasn't fully up to speed with what it was or how it worked. But Jim, you've convinced me. I think this has, has a lot of uh, benefits to bring this solution into our business. What can employers do to implement earn wage um, access via real-time payments, uh, real payments in the US? And um, you know, where, where can they get started? So typically, uh, the services are provided through your payroll processor. Right. So the first stop in, in any for any company who wants to implement something like this is to contact your payment, uh, your uh, your payroll provider. Um, now, what's happening in the U.S., the phenomenon we're seeing in the U.S. is that there are fintech firms who are popping up and offering these types of services. They are very leading edge, very cutting edge, and they're offering those services to the payroll providers. Yep. So yep. the distribution channel is typically from the payroll providers or the banks to these companies. Um, and what the payroll provider would do is then work through one of these uh, companies, one of these fintechs that are actually offering the services, and they will implement it. Uh, but that's typically the first step in the process. Once you've made that determination that you'd like to go further on this is to contact your payroll provider. Uh, and then they will tell you what the options are. And several different payroll providers in the U.S., uh, they leverage different uh, technology companies. So you'll find that the solutions that are offered are different from one another. 
So you really do need to start there to find out what options you have and exactly how they work. Uh, some are fully funded, uh, some are pre-funded. So it, it depends on the model that they have. But again, the first step in the process is really to sit down with your payroll provider and see what they offer and what companies they work with to implement that. Uh, and that's what we encourage most companies to do. Uh, and we talk a lot to, um, and not only to companies, but to payroll providers themselves uh, so that we can educate them, tell them who the fintechs are in the market who are offering these services. Uh, it is a community and it's growing by the day. Um, and, and one of the things I will tell you, the unique part about where RTP fits in all of this uh, is that it is an account to account service. So uh, I know EWA has been around for quite some time, uh, yeah. especially outside yeah. the U.S. I know you guys have had it. And I know there are card-based solutions uh, out there. But this is an account-based solution, which we have found through our research, is really what most customers want. If they have a bank account, they want the money deposited in their bank account because then they can decide what to do with it, uh, as opposed to download it to a card. Cards are necessary simply because you have a, a portion of the, uh, of the community that's unbanked, and that's how they want to get their money. But we have found that the large majority of customers like direct deposit of payroll, like the fact that this money is going into their bank account, and then it can be used to pay bills through a bank's bill pay platform, or it can be withdrawn or used in any other mechanism. So that's what we found, and, and that's what RTP has enabled by putting this platform in place. Yeah, it's certainly true for the UK. We don't put payment on cards at all over here. Everything goes directly into the positive account. So uh, it's, a, it's a process that I'm certainly very familiar with, uh, if others aren't. And um, as an expert in this space, Jim, I guess it leads me to ask one final question. I mean, you've got you've actually got your own payment nerds podcast at the Clearinghouse. If you haven't checked out, I'll put a link to that in the show notes. Um, but as an expert in this industry that sees it with a different lens, I mean, I see the world of payroll through my recruitment lens and from dealing with payroll managers about the problems and challenges they have. And I, I'm always looking at the trends and things that might be influencing the space. But I've never looked at it from, through the payments lens. So what's the question I haven't asked or what's the piece of information you'd like to share with our listeners today uh, before, you know, before the end of the show that can just really help crystallize any questions they may have or any doubts they may have or, or perhaps something they're not even aware of in relation to the work the Clearinghouse do and and and. Yeah, and, and, and payroll. So I, I will tell you that we are going through a global revolution in payments. Uh, I said that we uh, that the RTP network is the first new payment rail in the U.S. in 50 years. We are seeing the same pop up everywhere in the globe. Uh, obviously, the U.K. was one of the pioneers in this space uh, with faster payments. Uh, but we are seeing it in Asia. We are seeing it in South America. We are seeing it in Africa. We're seeing it throughout Europe. And, and again, you're going to see that instant and real-time payments are going to start introducing themselves in every phase of life. Um, it's going to introduce itself into the way people make payments. It's going to introduce itself into the way people want to get paid. Um, and as I've mentioned uh, throughout this conference, and I say to my bankers all the time, you don't want to wait to get into this game. Because if you wait, uh, not having these capabilities will wind up being a disadvantage for you. And you may wind up losing out on opportunities to competitors who are more, uh, more forward thinking. Uh, and I encourage everybody, don't sit on the sidelines. Uh, this process is moving and moving very, very rapidly. Uh, so even some of your employees may not know that they want it when they're asking for it. But when you talk to them about what experience they're looking for, they're looking for an instant experience, right? They're looking to get what they want when they want it. Uh, they're looking for the opportunity to make investment decisions when they want to, when those opportunities are there. They don't want to have to wait um, until the business is ready to give them their money. Uh, when, you, when you hear their desires and their expectations, they may not be saying, I want earned wage access or something like that, but listen to what they're saying. What they're saying is going to take you in that direction. Everything, everything that we see in commerce today is moving very, very rapidly toward um, an instantaneous and immediate experience. And the banking system is, is now finally catching up. Uh, so as you see this evolution taking place, figure out how you want to get into it. Uh, but I would encourage everybody who listens to this, don't sit on the sidelines for too long. Get into the game 
um, and you will find that that it will reap benefits from you down the road. It's a, it's a fantastic response that I'm, I would probably sound clip and listen back to, Jim. I was going to open the vault and ask you three questions. I think you managed to answer all three in that one response, which is the piece of advice you'd give to someone working in payroll. I would say early adoption might be that response. Don't sit on the fence. Let's get moving on this. If you had the power of foresight and you could change the industry with one actual improvement, what would it be? I imagine that's get on get on the train um, and 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 move, move, you know be be an early adopter because everyone's going to be adopting this over time. Um, really fascinating conversation around EWA. Really fascinating insight uh, to to hear about the payroll industry from from your perspective through the payments lens, uh, James. Thank you ever so much for joining me today on the Payroll Podcast. Now, for those who are interested in finding out more about the uh, the EWA, there's actually a case study that the Clearinghouse have um, have run. I'm going to put a link to that in the show notes. You can find out more about some real life use cases uh, for EWA. So you can have a look at that in there. There's going to be a link to the LinkedIn company page for the Clearinghouse as well as their website, of course. So please do take a look at that. It's theclearinghouse.org if you need to have a look. But I say it'll be linked directly through in our show notes. Uh, I'll also, with your permission, Jim, put a link to your um, LinkedIn profile. So if people do want to reach out to you directly to find out more, but they haven't got their head around it yet, or they want to get in touch with the clearinghouse to say, look, can you support us with our with the faster payments and the uh, and the, the wonderful uh, real-time payment network that you offer, um, that they can do so. Um, so, Jim, absolute pleasure having you on the Pearl Podcast today. Thank you. And of course, if you are a Pearl professional listening to this podcast, you need support with any recruitment-related requirements. We are operational in the U.S., uh, under JJ Recruitment Inc. And we're operational, of course, in the UK at jjrecruitment.com. So please do reach out to us. We'd love to support you. Um, and just leaves me to say a huge thank you for joining me again today. Remember to subscribe to the show. Please do leave us a review if you haven't already. It helps us to continue to deliver more shows. And one more final thank you to Jim Colasano for joining me today on the Pearl Podcast. Jim, thank you. Thank you, Nick.